Here we are. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. My lovely mom. As uh, we we're going to be working on getting Scola prepped. More more preparation for 3D printout. We've got the sculpture uh, where I like it, and now it's just a matter of getting all the pieces in. Uh, in, in order so that they can be molded and cast and then we could take it to conventions and people will look at this lovely statue and it will cost too much for anyone to buy it because it takes forever to make it but oh, they'll yeah. say oh what a fun character what is that from and we'll say well from this book which you can't yes, afford yes yes yeah <laughs> yeah uh, if I as I you know I'll talk more about it later, but Scola, to me, is not a hero. You don't think he he's a hero? He sees himself as a hero. Mm -hmm. He's definitely a protagonist. He's not an anti-hero. Right. And, he's, and he's a whole lot more than a sidekick. He comes this close to hero, and the reason why he sees himself as a hero is because what he's doing is going through all this hardship to extend civilization across the face of the planet. What? Oh, I'm doing everything I can to spill uh, <laughs> liquid on my computer and backup battery. <laughs> Are we okay? Yeah, probably. I'm just trying to keep everyone away. Make sure it's not uh, dripping into any uh, delicate holes. I've got the keyboard, and so <laughs> that was a dramatic opening for yeah. a monologue to go. I'm trying to make sure, make sure everyone's awake. All right, we're all right. There doesn't happen to be paper towels anywhere nearby, do there? Is there? I usually have some on hand just in case of emergency, and now I don't. So. But while we're waiting on the paper towels, you know, I was thinking about heroes, and so I go back heroes, in yes. time. But the, the earliest heroes, you know, thinking Gilgamesh. Uh, thinking that Odysseus. The, uh, Odysseus, the Iliad. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I first read the Iliad, and I kept thinking, this is what people saw as heroic, something worth emulating, something worth uh, quoting from. Mm -hmm. And these, in my point of view, these heroes were anything but. I saw them as thugs. I saw them as warlords. I saw them as um, brigands. You know, they would sail into a town uh, you know, when they're coming back from the war, and which was all about their honor, and they would tell the people there, give us what we need, you know, give us food, give us money, give us this, and we will protect you. And who are they protecting them from? Themselves, you know, as long as you, as long as you pay the bribe, we won't hurt you, otherwise we will. And to me, that is so opposite of heroic. And so I try to think, why did people think that was heroic? And I'm thinking that it was because they had these big grand adventures, they had to be courageous, uh, and, and Odysseus, uh, he had to be devious and clever as well. Um, and they lived according to their honor, and they faced their faith bravely. Mm -hmm. Well, in today's terms, uh, I, I think most of us will agree that you need a little bit more to be heroic. To me, you are heroic until you are sacrificing something for the good of someone else, or the good of society, or... Um, yeah, that's what, what Nietzsche called the slave mentality versus the, mm, was it, was it strictly master? I, I, I forget the dichotomy that he made, but he basically said, 
you know, before Jesus came in and ruined everything, uh, manly we men were, were men, heroes. Men yeah. were manly, yeah. And then, and then we got this this whole idea of se- uh, self sacrifice as the new paradigm for heroism, and now we're all a bunch of pushovers. Um, but the, it, what's interesting is how that um, dynamic is still very pervasive as far as there are, we're, we're seeing a little bit of a trend in, in fiction over the past 20-ish years maybe it's picked up I, I know in the 70s there were some films like Cool Hand Luke in the 50s yeah. there was Catcher in the Rye where you have these protagonists that are not that are not heroes they're the <laughs> anti-hero yeah yeah so in general uh, heroes are protagonists but not all protagonists are heroes or act heroically you know and I, I, then I was thinking about the, the series the Dune series mm-hmm. by Frank Herbert mm-hmm. if you read the entire series it sort of negates what the first book is about the, what, what he's trying to say in the entire series is don't wait for a savior there are no saviors okay now some people are going to take that to mean okay that means i need to be the savior i need to be the change that is wanted Mm -hmm. and other people are going to look at that and just cynically say um there's no heroes and i'm not one and all those other guys who think they're heroes are liars or fakes or self-deluded so yeah, what, what, what I'm interested in is, um, because with our, with our stories, I actually have a, a very um, clear goal in mind. Like, the, the, I have a specific idea of the impact I want to have on society with Tales from Talifar as a series. Okay. I want to make the world more loving, right, which is uh, subject to many forms of interpretation, however you would take that. But um, I, to me, a big part of being able to love well, <laughs> because the word love in English can apply from everything t- from, you know, infatuation and one night stands to, you know, dying on the cross uh, mm-hmm. for someone. So to taking a bullet, so self-sacrificial stuff. Um, and then in between things can get really muddled specifically with abusive relationships where love is being claimed, you know, or or right. where I'm I'm abusing myself in the name of love, you know, I'm going to stick with this person who's awful and making everyone, uh, you know, making me miserable and the kids miserable because right, right. because of love. And I can't even imagine what I say being interpreted that way and yet you are correct. So, yeah, so it, in the same way when we talk about heroism, um what I, what I think of a hero is someone who inspires me to be a more loving person, and that requires a lot of contextual breakdown of you know uh, or, or disambiguation. That it requires analyzing the situation you're in and saying in this context, what is the right, the loving, the heroic thing to do, and so. What I like about writing fantasy novel, you know, action adventure, you know, uh, quest type of stuff is that's often um, sort of it, it's putting into practice these ideas of here's a context, here is a problem, uh, how do how does the hero solve it, and sometimes uh, the hero solves it well, and sometimes poorly, and sometimes. A uh, person Fails. fails so consistently that you have to ask, are they still a hero? Uh, <laughs> and so I think all of those questions are, are interesting. Well, I, you know, if you read, read Game Coons' books, mm-hmm. the theme of most of them is that good people have to oppose evil. Okay. And they have to... Uh, do it in such a way that they defeat the evil. They can't just not like it. Right. So there's an element of bravery. Yes. And and we all understand that courage is doing what you need to do even when you're afraid. Mm-hmm. 
I can't remember who I heard saying this. Someone was that I was reading or listening to was saying that that they consider the greatest uh, human attribute to be bravery, over and above um, intelligence and wisdom and and I, I presumably and I, love. And I and I was assuming that's because they say. Without courage, you can't love adequately. Yeah, not, none of courage, the other attributes. You, you can't uh, develop, you know, you can't hear the wisdom that you need to hear because you, it's too awful to hear, so you won't. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I can uh, see that. It's kind of the, the activating agent that's required for all the other positive attributes to do well. It, it also activates a lot of negative uh, <laughs> attributes if you're looking for a fight because you're very brave um, ah, yeah. you know that sort of thing well there's, there's being belligerent and then there's being protective yes and so anyway the one of the biggest heroes in the sky king uh is sunrise okay He's, he's a little Tell bit, us about, he's, uh, he's, he's foolhardy. Give, give, us, give us a little bit of context of who he is in the story. He is the protagonist, the son of the king's best friend. Yes. Uh, he is the one who gets damaged, who gets hurt when he has an accident with the king's son. And the king's son has to move in with his family, uh, who are poor farmers. And Bomar has to do his chores until he heals and can do the chores because the, the king is so adamant that nobody can be a slave and nobody should have their labor stolen. Mm -hmm. And so he was saying that by the his son hurting Sunrise that he was stealing his labor. And so he had to make up for that by being the chores. So he grows up, he ends up going there alternating weeks. And he... I just want to interject real quick. I think one of the really brilliant things that you did in setting up Beaumark, who is our main character protagonist, to be a good guy. He's a very classic hero. He always wants to do what's right, even when it hurts him. Um, but you you gave a reason that a person would be like that, especially a royal person born into royalty, you know, designated to be the king, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you have the, the limit of the kind of government side where they say, hey, in order to become king, you have to prove, which means uh, he's going to have to fight to the death with someone. So it's set up that he has to be very disciplined and trained all the time. And that can produce... A variety of personality types but what you what you added to that was his father being very wise and saying if you're going to be a good ruler you need to actually understand the people that you're ruling and so having him sent to live with the commoners uh, would would imbue him with that that well, sense that of justice wasn't and, really why he did that <laughs> it, it was the dad did it because he knew Bomar could be happy then Okay, uh, that, that's a different take, but it's uh, but it, it still goes towards the same thing. Like there is a reason that Beaumark is that. Right, hey, Fantasy right. XD. And so he. <laughs> I've got guy liner on. <laughs> I'm a guy. Yes. Uh, how you doing? I, I don't think we've met before. Are uh, did you come because we we uh, posted in several different uh, fantasy writer group forums? I'm curious because. Uh, it's something I'd, I'd like to do whenever I have my mom on. Usually I'm just doing art streams, but when we talk about the books, uh, I figured, hey, we should we should invite writers because yes. we're talking writing. So uh, anyway, yes. Yeah, so so you were saying uh, Sunrise, heroic, uh, commoner boy in a village be right. becomes the best friend to Beaumont. Right. He's, he's reckless and that recklessness leads to disaster, but he accepts that disaster and tries to encourage Beaumark to continue on despite knowing that Beaumark is going to be devastated by the disaster that Sunrise experiences. Mm -hmm. um. 
and Beaumark worries all the time. He does. Because he, he cares about people. He doesn't want to do the wrong he, thing. And he doesn't want to kill anybody, and yet he knows he must. Mm -hmm. His choice is either he kills or he becomes ash in the river of lava. And then on top of that, someone else is chosen and has right. to die anyway. So it doesn't it doesn't reduce the death count for him to resist the system at that time. Um, so there's there's interesting parallels, I don't know, and it just just political theory and and morality and ethics with, you know, when you are in a system that damages others, how how do you navigate that? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it we have we have a lot of issues with um, as as our world becomes more connected and we're realizing the supply chains for our food and our iPhones and all the awful things that are actually required to make these things happen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're in some sense complicit, but at the same time, what do you do about that? You know, mm -hmm. if everyone just decided to go live off the grid, uh, everything we all starve to death. Yeah, they, <laughs> everything collapses. So, so how do you work within a system to change a system? I think that's correct, an interesting correct, theme. Correct. And and how does that apply to heroism? When, if if there is uh, innate complicity in just existing, how do you heroically uh, fight against that? Thoughts. I don't know. Good answer. <laughs> so what Beaumart Well, I mean, you, does, find, you find what you can. Mm -hmm. And so Beaumark finds himself on a fulcrum where he must decide that he's going to do what he absolutely hates in order to benefit people, specifically his people. He knows he can't change the whole world, but if he could just change the stuff that's going on on his island. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, he's joined by Scola, who has his own agenda. And Scola shows some heroic traits. He perseveres. Mm -hmm. He's got a lot of grit. He has a lot of grit. He um, demands much of himself. And those around him. Yes. <laughs> he, he's a mentor of sorts. OK, yeah. Kind of by necessity, not not by choice. Right, right, because Beaumark doesn't know the land that he's running around, and Beaumark keeps making mistakes that end up in disaster because he doesn't know who's king, how the government works, what the customs are, what people are asking of him, um, what's polite, what's impolite, and he's got his agenda, he's got to go collect these treasures so he can prove he went around the world and then do what he must do and and that's why he he tolerates I mean every so often he tries to get rid of Scola because Scola is such an irritating person <laughs> yep <clears throat> but Scola sees himself in the eyes of his people and his culture and their uh, priorities and it's really hard on Beaumark that Scola sees him the same way Beaumark would see a cow or a goat or a sheep. Mm -hmm. Herd animals that provide food, herd animals that provide uh, transportation. And that's sort of, you know, when you're the son of a king, that's sort of a bruising assessment. <laughs> so yeah. I can appreciate that. He looks pretty terrifying without his head, by the way. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, what? So, when you 3D print this, I, are you going to mm -hmm. have it those parts that you put together? Yeah. Really? Yeah, they're they're printed separately. <laughs> Why are they printed separately? Uh, Why wouldn't you make the whole body be what's being printed? If, if I didn't have to, yeah, if I didn't have to mold and cast it, I would love to just 3D print it. Someday 3D printers will be fast and cheap enough and high quality enough where you can just have it. But oh, okay. right now I, I have to. I you were 3D printing it. I, I am 3D printing it. Eventually. Uh, as, as soon as possible. 
Um, the, the, the reason that uh, the, it has to be cut up is in order to mold and cast it, I, uh, the, you know, if, if it was all together like this, these little, mm -hmm. these little dangly bits would they have air bubbles in them and stuff, and there are ways around that, but it's really, it's really tricky. Also, that if I printed him at the size I want, with a th traditional 3D printer, the resolution is, is not good. Uh, I have a fancier 3D printer that has much better resolution, but the print bed is only it's about totally that, that big. big right? yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, lots of lots of cutting and slicing until those. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a temporary thing that just kind of has to happen until our technology catches up with our imagination. Once we get those those Star Trek uh, uh, matter generator okay. devices. I guess they're not generating matter. What are they doing? Re replicating. Yeah, rep yeah, replicating. Once we get the replicators online, I won't have to do this awful yeah. process anymore. Yeah, except replicating takes the entire energy out for the sun to make a glass. <laughs> well, worth it when you could get <laughs> when you could get tea, Earl Grey, hot. Uh, okay, so so tell me why is Scola not a hero given the context that uh, he's that in. he's intended good to the world because his he is ruthless okay and how that's achieved and if that involves harming other people sure i mean they're problem. only hurt animals anyway right uh, he has contempt for humans and that includes contempt for bobots mm -hmm. Um, the that is normal for his for his people. In fact, Correct. he goes beyond what his people would tolerate when it comes to relating to the other races, right? Yeah, he considers that he likes humans, but that's likes humans next to these guys. Mm -hmm. They're all terrible bigots when it comes to humanity. So uh, my question to you then is, does that not make a, a person heroic when they rise above the cultural norm in applying humanity to, to others, even if it's imperfectly done? Because who of us can perfectly apply justice and humanity and love to everyone? Right. right. Well, that's a good point. And he's using Bomark as his tool because his body structure does not allow him to do the big, heroic, strong, fighting things mm -hmm. that uh, are often associated with heroes. In fact, one of the books I write later down the line, I ask myself the question, can someone who's sick and in bed <laughs> be a hero? Mm -hmm. And what can they be heroic about? And um, you, you, I, you I spent think... years sick in bed. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, you managed to to uh, raise uh, an autistic daughter, uh, a me, uh, two, two adopted kids, uh, my, my brother. So, so, so you did some heroic things. You, you wrote several I, books I never, I never during that time, didn't you? I never thought of it in that particular manner. And I wasn't thinking that when I was trying to figure out about it. Because I was trying to stretch. Does a hero have to be mobile? Does a hero have to be good looking? Does a hero have to be physically strong? Always. I suppose it depends on the manner of their quest, right? Mm -hmm. What is your quest? Um, what can you affect? Yeah. Um, if, if the pen is mightier than the sword, uh, you can affect a lot. Uh, in order for the pen to be mightier than the sword, you need a certain kind of culture, a certain yes, kind of apparatus yes. that <laughs> accept <laughs> words and reason and uh, and the rule of law, the rule of law and the ability to listen to the marginalized. Okay. Uh, if you think about um, President uh, World War II president in the wheelchair, names uh, escaping me, Roosevelt. Roosevelt. Um, they had to go through elaborate hoaxes to make sure that no one knew he was in a wheelchair, 
right? Yeah. Um, because at that time and culture, a person in a wheelchair was marginalized to the point that their opinion, their strength, their everything was questioned. Yes. Um, and so, thank God, we, we live in a society where that is less so. It's obviously still not perfectly so. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's just what, what you're talking about. Where, when one is being heroic, what are they heroing on? Right, right, <laughs> to, right. To use it right. as a verb. Well, different heroes have different aims. Yeah. And different personalities and different capabilities of how to achieve what it is they're aiming at. Mm-hmm. Now, the Greeks, I think, were correct in assuming that complete failure does not negate someone's heroism. Yeah. Uh, because to them, to meet your fate courageously and go down, <laughs> be conquered by fate, but boy, you gave it a good fight, um, that was a hero. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm thinking of the, the myth where the two boys, the brothers, they uh, either their, their ox died or their horses weren't available. So Some uh, series of events conspired to where their mother had to get to temple that morning and there was no way to do it except for them to pull the chariot themselves so they pulled so hard and so oh, fast that, yeah. that they died on the temple steps but they got their mother to church on time gall darn it and they were true heroes and in fact some <laughs> people called them fortunate heroes yeah because they died at their peak they never had to That's see right. themselves uh, fail morally or fail physically mm-hmm. or fail situationally. I mean, there's some things that can't be withstood. You know, Pompeii blows up and you're going to be ash along with everyone else, no matter how heroic you are. Indeed. Hmm. Yeah, I, I was... Um, it, the idea of exploring the different types of heroism that can exist uh, is is very uh, very exciting to me, and and one of the reasons that I wanted to design a world like this, where these sorts of things, you know, when you're when you're world building and creating your world, uh, the the big the big plus side to that is you get to make the rules, um, and you get to make them in such a way that that hopefully the story is um, uh, uh, applicable to modern readers who can who can kind of read between the lines or they can recognize their own kind of character or situation mm-hmm. in that in that fantasy setting but apply it to their real lives now the protagonist in all the novels is not necessarily a hero yeah. Or it takes them a really long time to get to hero level. <laughs> uh, um, it's that, and that's always a, a thing you have to balance because I've got one guy who starts out a real jerk. Mm-hmm. Actually, I've got two two pro- different protagonists in different books that are real jerks when they start out. And they, it is until you reach nearly the end of the book that they redeem themselves. Okay. And so I have to hope that readers will have patience and not just go, oh, I can't stand this guy and talk the book aside. And so you have to be careful when you're trying to draw a redemption arc. Mm-hmm. You have to give something that's pleasing about them at the beginning. Yeah. Some, and something that will foreshadow their capacity to, to grow and be better. Yeah, so on, on that front, Let's see. There are there's the there's so, so many different theories out there, but the one that I heard that I liked was this idea that um, if you knock there's there's three basic axes uh, that a character is likable on. Uh, one is one is competence. Uh, one is uh, what's the other one? There's you know doing good things. You know just kind of kind of moral uh, uh, goodness. And I can't remember what the other one is for the like of, like uh, of me. Courage? 
baby courage. I, I remember when you were talking earlier about the axis of competence, and I was thinking, well, but there's so many competent evil people. I, I, yeah. I'm not sure why that is so attractive. And then I think about, you know, so uh, that a lot of that has to do with wish fulfillment. You look at James Bond. Everybody yeah. loves the James Bond movies. I watched half of one and said, I'm done. Um, <laughs> Uh, that kind of hero, however competent he is, has absolutely no appeal to me. Yeah. Um, I think, I, so a lot of it has less to do with, uh, um, I like this character and think they're neat, as opposed to the things they're accomplishing in the world are fascinating because of how clever and good they are at doing yeah. this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Game of Thrones is like that to me. I don't particularly like any of the characters, uh, but seeing their core competency at play and how they, they are cross purposes with each other and how those play out, mm -hmm. that's fascinating. Um, and and I, I think with a lot of um, an, yeah, anti-hero narratives... Some of my favorite stories involve two good people at cross purposes. Yeah, that's always uh, interesting Orson as Scott well. Orson Scott Card is excellent at that. And he wrote a, a, a wonderful story whose title I'm blanking on. But the it's this uh, Chinese girl who is obsessive compulsive. Mm -hmm. And uh, the obsessive compulsive trait is on their planet a a signal, a symbol of being touched by God. Mm -hmm. And that gives them the mandate to rule. Right. And so there, someone comes to the planet who's opposing what the culture's doing, and then here's the person who's trying to embody what the culture is about. And they're both good people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's always, always interesting. Um, it, ju it just invites a kind of um, self-reflection, I think, on the part of the characters and the reader to think, you know, if I were in this situation, you know, what what is the right answer here? Is there a right answer? You know, that's those kind of things are interesting. Um, well, you know, as heroes are, are developing in literature, you are not going to find too many wildly popular, at any rate. Uh, heroes in books like Conan, Conan the Barbarian. Okay. I once sat down and read like 17 books of them in a row when I was a teenager and at somebody's house it had nothing to do so they, and they had this library so I went and read all the way through and by the end I was so thoroughly sick of Conan. <laughs> I mean, I love the adventure is, is he, part, is he a one but I love, I, I just, how he treated the natives. The natives were just obstacles that you step on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I kept saying, but but why should a guard be killed for being a guard? Is right. that right? Yeah. <clears throat> and so that's why I sometimes have Beaumark saying very... Uh, un -like re re things. ...republic sort of things, you know, because... <laughs> I am so against monarchy, and it was really hard for me to say, okay, I'm going to write about a monarchy and make the people sympathetic, mm -hmm. um, which I hope I succeeded in, but I like Scola, just despises royalty as much as I do, mm -hmm. and for much the same reasons. I forgot where I was going. Oh, uh, where was I going? Uh, let's see. Well, we were talking about something, and then I brought up anti-heroes. Uh, yeah, I. So, so many of my friends and relatives like Loki. Mm-hmm. And I hate Loki. Absolutely, you know. And they go, "Oh, but he's so cool, you know. He's so handsome. He's so I don't know what. I, maybe it's his his sartorial choices. But to me, once you have crossed the line of Squishing people because they're in your way. There's, I, and, and unless you specifically not. repent from that, you don't see a, a, a redeemable anything that's redeemable about them. Correct. So, so, yeah. And that may be too harsh, um, but there you go. That's how I feel. Yeah, it's there. There's an interesting. What that brings up to me is. Um, fandom and meta storytelling that happens 
because in the case of Loki, you, you feel sympathy because he's had this awful background, or he feels no. rejected. No. Nope. No. That's all. That's all textual. That is in the text. I'm talking metatextual, which is here's this actor Tom Hiddleston. I think is his name. Yeah. Uh, he's he's a great actor. He's 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 got a ton of charisma. He's very handsome. Um, some girls like his hair. Who knows? Uh, but all of that kind of plays a role then in the fan culture. Uh, and then uh, he wears cool costumes and he looks cool, so you, so you get um, cosplay happening. When cosplay happens, uh, people relate to the characters differently than if they were strictly just, you know, seeing the, the story unfold. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, uh, in today's modern internet world, you can't, you can't make a clean cut and say, here's the story, this character is just bad. Well, right. all, all villains we know have their own justifications and see themselves as the hero and everyone else is being in their way. I get that. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes I'm distressed that uh, um, people prefer the heroes to the hero. Yeah, the villains to the hero. I'm sorry, for, yes. Yeah. They prefer the villain to the hero. Yeah, I don't think I don't think it's about that as much as it's more a, a cult of personality around the actor or maybe it's just the idea of of a cool, detached uh, use of power. So yeah, maybe maybe there's some power fantasy going on in there. Um, Oh, which reminds me, I always laugh about Waifu, W-A-I-F-F-U, mm -hmm. uh, you know, meaning Kung Fu done by tiny little women with skinny little arms, and they're throwing 250-pound trained men around the room. It's leverage. Don't you understand leverage? Uh, well, <laughs> I understand that if I tried to do that, all I could be is a speed bump for them to trip over. <laughs> but... Um, <clears throat> Somebody pointed out to me, and I was like, oh, yes, of course. So we've got these superheroes that people want to identify with. You know, the Superman, the Spider-Man, the uh, Batman, the Captain America. Those are wish fulfillment for men. Mm -hmm. Why can't women have wish fulfillment, too? Yeah. And I was like, oh, if you look at it that way, sure. Physics be darned. I mean, yeah, it's not like we apply... Uh, you know, much physics to, to men heroes So in, in the super space or science fiction or fantasy either. Genre fiction in general pays very little respect to physics. And I think that's because that's not why people are there. Reading it and watching <laughs> it and participating yeah. in it. Um, they want the thrill of success. They want the thrill of adventure. They want the thrill of competition and winning. Mm -hmm. And um, I get that. Yeah. I want that too. <laughs> uh, so how, do, how does that apply to heroism and how we approach it when when we're creating our stories for Talifar? I, because we're, we're using a, a fairly unique a design constraint yeah. of trying to be scientifically well, plausible. I, I try, I've tried to follow some of the, the tropes. One way you can make someone who's starting out a jerk and then later redeems himself, but you can sort of telegraph that this is going to end up being a good person is they they save the cat. Mm -hmm. They pet the dog. Um, meaning they do something that that is not so selfish. They do something that something shows that, that they can them. care. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fun when in movies they actually make it a real cat that they actually save. You <laughs> it's know? very literal. Like, like yeah. Hellboy. That was so much fun when he saved that box of kittens. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and in the movie John Wick, the, the bad guy literally kicks a puppy. So. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that guy's got to die. <laughs> So it's with great relish that the audience uh, re receives their um, catharsis at the end. He gets, gets his just desserts for kicking that puppy. Um, 
But yeah, they so 76, hello, how are you doing? The uh let's see. Well, oh, now, now I had now a thought, and it's gone. Back. I got, I got so <laughs> caught up on that puppy. Um, I'm gonna talk art real quick okay. while you think of uh, the next thing to talk about. So, what I'm doing here is this is called a Boolean operation, which, if you know math or com computer, you, you I know kind of know what that Boolean. is. <laughs> In art, it's very different. In art, well, it's not very different, but it has a very different manifestation, which is here is this head and here is the body, and these are two separate pieces, right? But when I do a Boolean operation, it's subtracting the geometry that's in the head from the body, so you get a negative print of it. So one thing you're seeing here is these little teeth marks and these teeth marks are the head here I'll show you if you look at just the head you can see he's got these little needle teeth here mm -hmm. and so these little needle teeth are biting into his bottom lip okay. so what i'm trying to uh, fix right now for when these pieces get printed separately. I really like that you can kind of see into his mouth beyond his little beak here a little bit. Um, and I'm trying to right now get the inside of the mouth to accommodate um, his floating eyeballs. Both upper and lower. Yeah, so right now his teeth are biting in into there and I want to, to fix that. And his beak By is- By lowering the gum, I suppose. Yep. So I already had pushed the, his bottom jaw in to, to accommodate because they were stabbing right through those teeth. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I'm working on right now. Um, so what are the personality types of protagonists that you've made for Talifar stories? What do you think is their common heroic essence, the ones that are heroes? Well, I'm I'm thinking they uh, think of Sunrise, Bomar, Pledge Cap, and uh, courage. Yeah, there you go, courage mm -hmm. and persistence and a certain empathy. They none of them were totally selfish people. Pledge Cap whines a lot, but he's got a lot to whine about. Um, that doesn't keep him from doing what he knows he's supposed to do, even though he hates every step of the way. Mm -hmm. And when he finally figures that this thing is going to kill him, he says, he, you know, he's not going to be killed running away. He's going to be killed going toward what he doesn't want to go toward, because that's his duty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fulfilling obligations dutifully. Um, how? So, a, a, a very common thing in almost every Hollywood three act structure and, and many novels, especially genre works, is the initial call to action is a bit of a decoy. And at the beginning of the third act, there's a flip and an, oh no, what I was doing won't work or is, was, you know, there's a character I was working for that turns out to be a bad guy or, you know, any number of I, those I, things. I can see that as a characteristic, the adaptability. Yeah. Uh, it, you, you have to, and, and the, actually it makes me think the inverse of that is pretty common in villains is, uh, they cannot list they cannot be reasoned with uh, if things change they won't acknowledge it and they just bullheadedly press on with that so I'm guessing that's kind of a, a kind of an archetype in the human brain to say it's it's good to be open to new information and to change your strategy based on that how does that how does that rectify or um, 
rectify is not the word. Uh, when two things seem to be in conflict. Interact. And, sure. Uh, not the word I wanted, but it's it's that there's 15 words that I know and that will never come to my brain when I need them, <laughs> and, that, and this is one of them. Um, <laughs> so so how, how do you uh, put these things together? The idea that you need to be able to think on your feet, uh, modify your your goals and your ambitions, and what you think is right based on your information with uh, grit, determination, being steadfast, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In, in a sense, are you not betraying your th those things when you change tactics or strategies in the middle of a fight? Probably a dumb question. I don't but. think so. Or perhaps I misunderstood the question. It's it's an insipid question, but I feel like it could evoke some interesting discussion. So, if if things, Sigrid, hello, how you doing? Um, if if everything is straightforward in a story, it's it's typically considered boring. You know, if if your mission at the beginning is exactly what the hero has to do, and they just go and execute it, and it's done. Uh, it's not exciting to most people. Uh, a hero, typically, one of the things we just, we just were, was recognizing is that a hero has grit and determination and stick to itness. They're going to do the thing. They receive new information, and now the thing they have to do is different. But the way they know that is because it's based on some higher value or, or a higher goal and the quest that was originally given was just a means to achieve that goal. Uh, when that means is exhausted or proved to be wrong, they switch to another means. Yeah. Okay, but they keep this, they keep, it's a way of fulfilling their original goal, but in another direction. Yeah. Sometimes it's abandoning the first goal because they recognize that it must be superseded by this higher, bigger, better goal. Mm -hmm. The I, I, I think what's interesting to me about that is I, I think it gets at another heroic trait, which is the ability to uh, not necessarily articulate, but they know what was the higher goal. It wasn't just execute these instructions and that makes you a good person or makes a good thing happen. Because when the revelation happens in the third act, they have to be able to say, no, there's something higher, better, more important that I need to act on differently. Um, so it, it, it's kind of related, I think, to, to that idea of heroism as being able to, to think, think strategically, change your mind, be adaptive, be aware of context. Um, so, I, I, I'm trying to trying to wrap all those things into one idea, and, and maybe maybe that idea is. And I lost the already. Um, Let's quit just because they discover their wrong. They they change. Okay. You don't quit, but they change. That's an interesting thought. Well, at least that's what we like in heroes now. We like our heroes to be compassionate. We want the male protagonist to not be horrible to women. We want uh, our protagonist to be fairly compassionate to the uh, weaker people. Mm -hmm. And that was absolutely not a consideration some hundreds of years ago. Yeah. Thousands of years ago, that was not a thought. Mm -hmm. To be a hero simply meant to do brave deeds that reinforced the, the cultural values of what it meant to be a whatever they were supposed to be, a, a knight, a warrior, a etc. I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to think of who were protagonists uh, before modern novels became a thing. Right, right. 
Well, I think of the person who does a big, courageous, adventurous thing is not always a hero. Mm -hmm. If it only benefits themselves, I mean, that it benefits themselves is good, but that can't be the only thing they're thinking about, or else they're protagonists but not heroes. So, um, from a from a sociological standpoint, you know what stories were doing a thousand years ago. Um, I, I assume they were modeling what the society said yeah. people great, should be doing. Great man was the one who conquered. Yeah. The not so great man was the one who was conquered, and so uh, and was generous to the followers. Yeah, the, the the great man shared his gifts, mm -hmm. and he got them by conquering and by being really horrid to people who weren't of his tribe, of his family, of his nation. Yeah, that that might be. I wonder if that's one of the biggest differences in the evolution of of the hero myth. Um, you know, in modern times, is that. Um, universalism, that uh, cosmopolitanism of recognizing that just because they're not in my tribe doesn't mean they're not human and don't deserve the rights and respect of, of humans. Um, that which is, uh, so in a, in a fantasy context, the one of the biggest critiques of the fantasy genre in general right now, because you know we're becoming aware of marginalized voices and everything, is uh, fantasy and sci-fi for that matter. Anything that has other sentient, you know, peoples in it is boy, that sure just seems like shallow coding for different racial, you know, race race relations. And I really tried hard not to do that. Yeah. Um, it makes me wonder if it's possible to not do it. Well, I, <laughs> not so much not possible, but so much as people will interpret the way they want to interpret. And they will bring their sensibilities into it. So even if you're not using a word or a people as a code, sometimes other people will come in and that's assume, what I mean. yes, you are. That, that's what I mean by impossible. Uh, it, is it one of those things where someone somewhere will always see what you're doing as nefarious? Uh, Aurora W says a villain is cultivating his ego. Um, yeah, that's uh, so ego. That's that's an interesting kind of lens through which to look at the the hero villain di yeah, dynamic. And, and why I didn't like the heroes of the Iliad. Mm -hmm. uh, because it was about their honor. So they could go out and, and kill people without thinking about the people they killed, their family, their, their society, their structure, and the loss of that person. Because this guy needed to have his honor honored. Yeah. Um. And so all people are seen as tools uh, in that kind of mindset. Yeah, it always blew me away, like the like the Helen of Troy idea of you know this this one guy uh, really loves this woman, therefore thousands and thousands of people need to fight and die. Yeah. <laughs> huh. That's it. It's. But it was to maintain honor. Yeah, and and that honor. And if it's you aren't, I, I, in, in those kind of times, if you're not honored, if you're not feared, someone's going to come and move into your territory and take over. Yeah, that's actually another really kind of kind of tricky wrinkle in, in examining history and, and the motivations for people is you had, there's a context that we, that's so foreign to us. Um, you know, it's, it's, I, I've read, I was reading some stuff about the sociology and prisons and how that works. Basically, the more um, tr 
tribal a society is, you know, broke broken down into tribes, um, the the more the group cohesion is necessary for survival. That's just the way human brains work. Is the natural state is not to live and let live. It's someone, and and that's the thing. It's it's the, this uh, network theory of bad actors. You don't need everyone to be evil. You need just a sprinkle to make the system respond in such a way that everyone has to be evil. And <laughs> that's that's what's uh, been so brilliant about kind of the the arc of history. And, and it's so hopeful and encouraging that somehow parts of human culture have pulled up out of that morass. And it's, who knows where to put, put the finger, it's probably a, a, a huge uh, network of reasons why that happened. But um, when you're talking about cultures that are back in there to impose our standards of morality on them and say you're a bad person because you you did this thing to this other tribe person when in fact it could be you know if they if one person from another tribe comes and says i spit on the grave of your father and you don't respond they're going to go back to their tribe and say hey these guys over here are ripe for conquering they're pushovers so if, if you don't go well i'm going to spit on the grave of your father and i challenge you to a duel uh, you're actually being immoral by not fighting to the death over something like that because of the system you're in. Again, getting back to that kind of how do, how do you how do you change systems that have perverse incentives and these kind of necessary things? What's so with Talifar, with our book series, our world building, we have an interesting juxtaposition where we're not positing just some fantasy world up out of nowhere, kind of like a Middle Earth or, or something like that, where it's just Here's these races, they exist in this culture, blah, blah, blah. We're saying these are humans from our not too distant future, but then post-apocalypse, because they're they're planted on another planet and thousands of years later. So they still have the heritage of our our traditions, philosophies, uh, that of sort of thing. a society that would produce spaceships. Yeah, and, and the type that would produce ideas that are capable of again pulling humans out of that morass of of intertribal hostility that that's just yeah, the baseline so, so there's some there's some cultural residue that goes down the generations yeah and it could be more or less manifest in the different cultures on right. on the planet so so it's interesting to, to play with that idea of and i, I think that's something that post-apocalyptic uh genre in general uh, that's kind of the core themes is, you know, is there a way to to get back? You know, once you've lost the infrastructure that supports our, our fluffy, safe lives where we can afford right. to wag our fingers at people who get shot because someone threatened to steal your shoes or, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, once that's the reality again, how do you, <laughs> can you get back? The answer in most post-apocalypse is no. Um, but also because another core theme is uh, the fantasy of, of all these uh, guns I've been hoarding are finally paying off and all those stupid liberals who told me my I shouldn't have guns, they're all dead now because... Uh, well, anyway, that's a whole other topic. But anyway... Um, <laughs> Don't go there. I won't go there. The... the so, so the idea of mixing these two of the, 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 the baseline tribal and the whatever we're at now, I'm not going to put a label on it because it's a million things. It's fragmented and fractured and post-modernity mm -hmm. and there's Western and Eastern and you know, everything. But um, it's, it's fertile soil for exploring these kind of juxtapositions in the same space, I think. So that's one of the things I'm excited about these books is how they how they explore those nuances i like nuanced things i think i finally got his teeth and lips lining up pretty well put it together and let's see well you can't tell from the outside <laughs> so. This well, is... you put it together and then you take it apart and you see what got indented, right? Is that yeah, what you were that, telling me? Yeah, that, I mean, that's what this is. This is the indentation from the head. So, you can see there's still a little bit of um, 
cute little beak mark there, which makes sense. You press something hard into a soft lip. Here's a few little teeth marks here, but, but nothing, nothing to write home about. And the bottom teeth here are cut off by the upper palate a little bit. But all of that's totally acceptable for our purposes. So that's good. Although it looks like he's got a whisker that's poking down into his inner mouth. So I need to adjust that on the, on the head. Hey Sigrid, we're doing well. Thank you. Yeah, my uh, so my mom here dropped off my son Shane, who was down helping to build a house for um, my autistic sister, and uh, they're building a an, a. Tell us about that house. What is it exactly? That makes it different than normal houses. Well, it's called an auxiliary dwelling unit. But, but specifically the construction of it is oh oh yeah because uh, uh, our daughter is so very very hard on houses with that meaning too and and makes things wet and sloppy with that meaning too <laughs> um, and uh, things decay around her things get broken around her things she's it, an agent of chaos and and she's exactly so and um, because we live in a climate where black mold in housing is a huge problem. I wanted to build a house that would be bug proof so I never had to worry about termites. It doesn't mean bugs don't come in, but it means they can't eat the metal studs. We have metal studs, we have a metal roof, um, we have uh, cement fiber siding that should be fairly um, flame proof so our house you know and the studs aren't going to burn and the ceilings that are roofers are going to burn and then the sheetrock is hard to burn the, the paper on it burns easily enough but the the, the um, uh, white chemical inside I cannot believe um, the calcium well anyway that doesn't burn well um, so I tried to make it mold proof, bug proof, fire proof, earthquake proof. Yeah, I think that's it. And in fact, um, I'm thinking that when the big one hits, uh, I mean, if it goes to Looks nine, like it might all, be if, if, if it goes up to like nine, we're all gone. But theoretically, the house could, ha could handle eight. I don't know if that's true or not. We, we'll find out when it happens. But if it does happen, I'm going to be housing the entire neighborhood in my three-car <laughs> three garage uh, because everyone else's houses are going to fall down. Okay. Yeah, and uh, so this is a project you guys have been working on for how many years now? Uh, you mean this particular house? Uh, that just you're so oh you, trying you, to you find got a lot. my daughter a safe place to yeah, live. You, so you had to find the lot. You had to get all the paperwork figured out, all the technical right, bureaucratic right, right. stuff. And it's at least five years. Yeah. But finding her a, a place that would be hers that nobody could boot her out of. Mm-hmm. Um, that's obviously that, that's important. That's been, been decades. Uh, we, we got her into a, a duplex, so she had her own place, and she loves it. She loves it. I'm not yelling at her all the time. No, don't cut that up. <laughs> um, her, her biggest crime still was when I was a teenager, she oh. found my collection of Nintendo Power Magazine and glued a bunch of pages together. So... That was before her cutting everything phase. At, at least <laughs> she didn't cut them up, but she glued a bunch of pages together. Oh. Yeah, but anyway, so everything in the house is hers, and she's a very content person. Uh, but the, the duplex is decaying around her, in part because of, of how when she makes coffee, coffee grounds and water get everywhere. And so wet wood decays. Mm -hmm. So we have... Uh, trying to minimize the amount of wood in the house. 
yeah, makes sense. But uh, boy, that was rough. And there was only one builder in the entire state who was able to do it. Uh, the county. Yeah, in the entire county who could do it. And uh, yeah, so it's been quite a journey. Anyway, my son's back now and he can finally start working. I don't know if any of you guys saw, I posted, you know, it was in the spring. I took him on his 18th birthday uh, extravaganza, coming of age. Uh, no, we did a coming of age ceremony. This was more his like last trip as father and son of a, of a boy, you know. And so we went around the desert and we shot a bunch of footage of us fighting space invaders. And now that he's done with the construction, he's finally going to start working on these special effects. And he's going to make uh, an amazing uh, dad son road adventure movie that will be his portfolio piece that can hopefully get him. A uh, job doing video editing or something, which is something you really enjoy. So that's exciting. So that's why my mom's here today, and we're talking. So, uh, but I think I'm wrapping up this process, and you need to get back and tell builders what to do and what not to do, and then they'll continue to ignore you and do whatever they were going to do anyway. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's just that's the process. Huh? That's the process. Yeah. All right. So here we go. We've got we've got all our stuff together. Uh, Mr. Scola is looking looking fine. Oh, well, not, <laughs> not like that. He's not. There we go. Now he's looking fine. Um, I don't know why his arms aren't showing up. Oh, because they're separate. Yeah, so hopefully this guy will be a statue that we can uh, have to give away for prizes and, um, and sell on our web store. That'll be exciting. Someday we'll have a, a website soon. I'm going to be setting up a square uh, shop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I've got this. I got I, this I, I from keep trade show. And I go, well, wait a minute, there's no buttons. How do you how do you work the thing if there's no buttons? I believe it uh, hooks into your phone and an app runs it. So yeah, this is this is for point of sale oh, okay. purchases. Okay, so all the buttons are on the phone. Yeah, see this plugs into the phone. This is a, a chip got reader it. card, one of those two things, and then this you can plug your card into. So anyway, we're gonna have stuff for sale. Uh, live in person at events that we go to and uh, also on the interweb so if you get a chance to go to Norwestcon come by and say hi yeah please come to Norwestcon uh, cool Sigrid remembers you can't wait looking forward to the movie finished yeah me too I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that to having this little keepsake that he can show his kids and grandkids and say this is what we did back in 2018. Just you like know. the videos of you breaking pool cues over people's heads. Yeah. Hopefully this one will be a little more heartwarming. <laughs> so. Alright, so that'll do it for today, guys. Thanks for stopping by and listening to us prattle on about stuff. And uh, we'll see you guys on... Uh, I'll, I'll probably see you guys tomorrow, the normal live stream. But uh, next time you're up, uh, we'll be together again. So... <laughs> We'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye.